Part two, chapter twelve, the man of property. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Harnick. The Foresight Saga, The Man of Property, by John Galsworthy. Part two, chapter twelve. June pays some calls. Jolyon stood in the narrow hall at Broadstairs, inhaling that odour of all cloths and herrings which permeates all respectable seaside lodging houses. On a chair, a shiny leather chair displaying its horsehair through a hole in the top left corner, stood a black dispatch case. This he was filling with papers with the times and the bottle of eau de cologne he had meetings that day of the globular gold concessions and the new colliery company limited to which he was going up for he never missed a board to miss a board would be one more piece of evidence that he was growing old and this his jealous foresight spirit could not bear his eyes, as he filled that black dispatch case, looked as if at any moment they might blaze up with anger. So gleams the eye of a schoolboy, baited by a ring of his companions. But he controls himself, deterred by the fearful odds against him. And old Jolyon controlled himself, keeping down with his masterful restraint now slowly wearing out the irritation fostered in him by the conditions of his life. He had received from his son an unpractical letter, in which, by rambling generalities, the boy seemed to try to get out of answering a plain question. I have seen Bosini, he said. He is not a criminal. The more I see of people, the more I am convinced that they are never good or bad, merely comic or pathetic. You probably don't agree with me. Old Julian did not. He considered it cynical to so express oneself. He had not yet reached that point of old age when even foresights, bereft of those illusions and principles which they have cherished carefully for practical purposes but never believed in, bereft of all corporeal enjoyment stricken to the very heart by having nothing left to hope for breaks through the barriers of reserve and say things they would never have believed themselves capable of saying perhaps he did not believe in goodness and badness any more than his son but as he would have said he didn't know, couldn't tell, there might be something in it, and why, by an unnecessary expression of disbelief, deprive yourself of possible advantage. Accustomed to spend his holidays among the mountains, though, like a true foresight, he had never attempted anything too adventurous or too foolhardy, he had been passionately fond of them and when the wonderful view mentioned in Baedeker, fatiguing but repaying, was disclosed to him after the effort of the climb, he had doubtless felt the existence of some great dignified principle, crowning the chaotic strivings, the petty precipices, and ironic little dark chasms of life. This was as near to religion, perhaps, as his practical spirit had ever gone. But it was many years since he had been to the mountains. He had taken June there two seasons running after his wife died and had realized bitterly that his walking days were over. To that old mountain, given confidence in a supreme order of things, he had long been a stranger. He knew himself to be old, yet he felt young, and this troubled him. It troubled and puzzled him, too, 
to think that he, who had always been so careful, should be father and grandfather to such as seemed born to disaster. He had nothing to say against Joe. Who could say anything against the boy, an amiable chap? But his position was deplorable, and this business of June's nearly as bad. It seemed like a fatality, and the fatality was one of those things no man of his character could either understand or put up with. In writing to his son, he did not really hope that anything would come of it. Since the ball at Rogers, he had seen too clearly how the land lay. He could put two and two together quicker than most men, and with the example of his own son before his eyes, knew better than any foresight of them all that the pale flame singes man's wings whether they will or no. In the days before June's engagement, when she and Mrs. Soames were always together, he had seen enough of Irene to feel the spell she cast over man. She was not a flirt, not even a coquette, words dear to the heart of his generation which loved to define things by a good, broad, inadequate word. But she was dangerous. He could not say why. Tell him of a quality innate in some women, a seductive power beyond their own control. He would but answer, Humbug! She was dangerous, and there was an end of it. He wanted to close his eyes to that affair. If it was, it was. He did not want to hear any more about it. He only wanted to save June's position and her peace of mind. He still hoped she might once more become a comfort to himself. And so he had written. He got little enough out of the answer. As to what young Jolion had made of the interview, there was practically only the queer sentence, I gather that he is in the stream. The stream? What stream? What was this newfangled way of talking? He sighed and folded the last of the papers under the flap of the bag. He knew well enough what was meant. June came out of the dining room and helped him on with his summer coat. From her costume and the expression of her little resolute face, he saw at once what was coming. I'm going with you, she said. Nonsense, my dear. I go straight into the city. I can't have you racketing about. I must see old Mrs. Smeech. Oh! Your precious lame ducks, grumbled out old Jolion. He did not believe her excuse, but ceased his opposition. There was no doing anything with that pertinacity of hers. At Victoria, he put her into the carriage which had been ordered for himself, a characteristic action, for he had no petty selfishness. Now don't you go tiring yourself, my darling, he said, and took a cab on into the city. June went first to a back street in Paddington, where Mrs. Meech, her lame duck, lived, an aged person connected with the charring interest. But after half an hour spent in hearing her habitually lamentable recital, and dragooning her into temporary comfort, she went on to Stanhope Gate. The great house was closed and dark. She had decided to learn something at all costs. It was better to face the worst and have it over. And this was her plan, to go first to Phil's aunt, Mrs. Baines, and failing information there, to Irene herself. She had no clear notion of what she would gain by these visits. 
At three o'clock she was in Lounge Square. With a woman's instinct, when trouble is to be faced, she had put on her best frock and went to the battle with a glance as courageous as old Jolyon's itself. Her tremors had passed into eagerness. Mrs. Baines, Bosinney's aunt, Louisa was her name, was in her kitchen when June was announced, organizing the cook, for she was an excellent housewife, and, as Baines always said, there was a lot in a good dinner. He did his best work after dinner. It was Baines who built that remarkably fine row of tall crimson houses in Kensington, which compete with so many others for the title of the ugliest in London. On hearing June's name, she went hurriedly to her bedroom, and taking two large bracelets from a red Morocco case in a locked drawer, put them on her white wrists, for she possessed in a remarkable degree that sense of property which, as we know, is the touchstone of foresightism and the foundation of good morality. Her figure of medium height and broad build, with a tendency to embon point, was reflected by the mirror of her white wood wardrobe in a gown made under her own organization or one of those half tints reminiscent of the distempered walls of corridors in large hotels. She raised her hands to her hair, which she wore a la Princesse de Gaulle's, and touched it here and there, settling it more firmly on her head, and her eyes were full of an unconscious realism, as though she were looking in the face of one of life's sordid facts and making the best of it. In youth, her cheeks had been of cream and roses, but they were mottled now by middle age, and again that hard, ugly directness came into her eyes as she dabbed a powder puff across her forehead. Putting the puff down, she stood quite still before the glass, arranging a smile over her high, important nose, her chin, never large and now growing smaller with the increase of her neck, her thin-lipped, down-drooping mouth. Quickly, not to lose the effect, she grasped her skirt strongly in both hands and went downstairs. She had been hoping for this visit for some time past. Whispers had reached her that things were not all right between her nephew and his fiancée. Neither of them had been near her for weeks. She had asked Phil to dinner many times. His invariable answer had been too busy. Her instinct was alarmed, and the instinct in such matters of this excellent woman was keen. She ought to have been a foresight. In young Jolyon's sense of the word, she certainly had that privilege and merits description as such. She had married off her three daughters in a way that people said was beyond their deserts, for they had the professional plainness only to be found, as a rule, among the female kind of the more legal callings. Her name was upon the committees of numberless charities connected with the church dances, theatricals, or bazaars, and she never lent her name unless sure beforehand that everything had been thoroughly organized. She believed, as she often said, in putting things on a commercial basis. The proper function of the church, of charity indeed, of everything, was to strengthen the fabric of society. Individual action, therefore, she considered immoral. Organization was the only thing, for by organization alone could you feel sure that you were getting a return for your money. Organization and again organization. 
and there is no doubt that she was what old Jolyon called her a dab at that. He went further, he called her a humbug. The enterprises to which she lent her name were organized so admirably that by the time the takings were handed over, they were indeed skim milk, divested of all cream of human kindness. But as she often justly remarked, sentiment was to be deprecated. She was, in fact, a little academic. This great and good woman, so highly thought of in ecclesiastical circles, was one of the principal priestesses in the temple of Forsytism, keeping alive day and night a sacred flame to the god of property, whose altar is inscribed with those inspiring words, nothing for nothing, and really remarkably little for sixpence. When she entered the room, it was felt that something substantial had come in, which was probably the reason of her popularity as a patroness. People liked something substantial when they had paid money for it, and they would look at her, surrounded by her staff in charity ballrooms, with her high nose and her broad, square figure, attired in a uniform covered with sequins, as though she were a general. The only thing against her was that she had not a double name. She was a power in upper-middle-class society, with its hundred sets and circles, all intersecting on the common battlefield of charity functions, and on that battlefield brushing skirts so pleasantly with the skirts of society with the capital S. She was a power in society with the smaller s, that larger, more significant and more powerful body where the commercially Christian institutions, maxims and principle, which Mrs. Baines embodied, were real lifeblood circulating freely, real business currency, not merely the sterilized imitation that flowed in the veins of smaller society with the larger S. People who knew her felt her to be sound, a sound woman who never gave herself away nor anything else if she could possibly help it. She had been on the worst sort of terms with Bosini's father, who had not infrequently made her the object of an unpardonable ridicule. She alluded to him now that he was gone as her poor, dear, irreverent brother. She greeted June with the careful effusion of which she was a mistress, a little afraid of her, as far as a woman of her eminence in the commercial and Christian world could be afraid, for so slight a girl, June had a great dignity, the fearlessness of her eyes gave her that. And Mrs. Baines, too, shrewdly recognized that behind the uncompromising frankness of June's manner, there was much of the foresight. If the girl had been merely frank and courageous, Mrs. Baines would have thought her cranky and despised her. If she had been merely a foresight, like Francie, let us say she would have patronized her from sheer weight of metal. But June, small though she was, Mrs. Baines habitually admired quantity, gave her an uneasy feeling and she placed her in a chair opposite the light. There was another reason for her respect which Mrs. Baines, too good a churchwoman to be worldly, would have been the last to admit. She often heard her husband describe old Jolyon as extremely well off, and was biased towards his granddaughter for the soundest of all reasons. Today she felt the emotion with which we read a novel describing a hero and an inheritance 
nervously anxious lest by some frightful lapse of the novelist the young man should be left without it at the end her manner was warm she had never seen so clearly before how distinguished and desirable a girl this was she asked after old jolyon's house a wonderful man for his age so upright and young-looking and how old was he eighty-one she would never have thought it they were at the sea very nice for them she supposed june heard from phil every day her light grey eyes became more prominent as she asked this question but the girl met the glance without flinching no she said he never writes mrs baines's eyes dropped they had no intention of doing so but they did they recovered immediately of course not that's phil all over he was always like that was he said june the brevity of the answer caused mrs baines's bright smile a moment's hesitation she disguised it by a quick movement and spreading her skirts afresh said why my dear he is quite the most harum scarum person one never pays the slightest attention to what he does the conviction came suddenly to june that she was wasting her time even were she to put a question point blank she would never get anything out of this woman do you see him she asked her face crimsoning the perspiration broke out on mrs baines forehead beneath the powder oh yes i don't remember when he was here last indeed we haven't seen much of him lately he's so busy with your cousin's house i am told it will be finished directly we must organize a little dinner to celebrate the event do come and stay the night with us thank you said june again she thought i am only wasting my time this woman will tell me nothing she got up to go a change came over mrs baines she rose too her lips twitched she fidgeted her hands something was evidently very wrong and she did not dare to ask this girl who stood there a slim straight little figure with her decided face her set jaw and resentful eyes she was not accustomed to be afraid of asking questions all organization was based on the asking of questions but the issue was so grave that her nerve normally strong was fairly shaken only that morning her husband had said old mr forsyte must be worth well over a hundred thousand pounds and this girl stood there holding out her hand holding out her hand the chance might be slipping away she couldn't tell the chance of keeping her in the family and yet she dared not speak her eyes followed june to the door it closed then with an exclamation mrs baines ran forward wobbling her bulky frame from side to side and opened it again too late she heard the front door click and stood still an expression of real anger and mortification on her face june went along the square with her bird-like quickness she detested that woman now whom in happier days she had been accustomed to think so kind was she always to be put off thus and forced to undergo this torturing suspense she would go to phil himself and ask him what he meant she had the right to know she hurried on down sloane street till she came to bosinney's number passing the swing door at the bottom she ran up the stairs her heart thumping painfully at the top of the third flight she paused for breath 
and holding on to the banisters, stood listening. No sound came from above. With a very white face, she mounted the last flight. She saw the door with his name on the plate, and the resolution that had brought her so far evaporated. The full meaning of her conduct came to her. She felt hot all over. The palms of her hands were moist beneath the thin silk covering of her gloves. She drew back to the stairs, but did not descend. Leaning against the rail, she tried to get rid of a feeling of being choked, and she gazed at the door with a sort of dreadful courage. No, she refused to go down. Did it matter what people thought of her? They would never know. No one would help her if she did not help herself. She would go through with it. Forcing herself, therefore, to leave the support of the wall, she rang the bell. The door did not open, and all her shame and fear suddenly abandoned her. She rang again and again, as though in spite of its emptiness she could drag some response out of that closed room, some recompense for the shame and fear that visit had cost her. It did not open. She left off ringing and, sitting down at the top of the stairs, buried her face in her hands. Presently she stole down, out into the air. She felt as though she had passed through a bad illness and had no desire now but to get home as quickly as she could. The people she met seemed to know where she had been, what she had been doing, and suddenly, over on the opposite side, going towards his rooms from the direction of Montpellier Square, she saw Bosny himself. She made a movement to cross into the traffic. Their eyes met, and he raised his hat. An omnibus passed, obscuring her view. Then, from the edge of the pavement, through a gap in the traffic, she saw him walking on, and June stood motionless, looking after him. End of part two, chapter twelve. June pays some calls. Recording by Eva Harney. Part 2, Chapter 13 of The Man of Property. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Harnick. The Foresight Saga, The Man of Property by John Galsworthy. Part 2, Chapter 13 Perfection of the house. One mock turtle clear, one oxtail, two glasses of port. In the upper room at French's, where a Forsyte could still get heavy English food, James and his son were sitting down to lunch. Of all eating places, James liked best to come here. There was something unpretentious, well-flavoured, and filling about it, and though he had been to a certain extent corrupted by the necessity for being fashionable, and the trend of habits keeping pace with an income that would increase, he still hankered in quiet city moments after the tasty flesh-pots of his earlier days. Here you were served by hairy English waiters in aprons. There was sawdust on the floor, and three round gilt looking-glasses hung just above the line of sight. They had only recently done away with the cubicles, too, in which you could have your chop prime chump with a floury potato without seeing your neighbours like a gentleman. He tucked the top corner of his napkin behind the third button of his waistcoat, a practice he had been obliged to abandon years ago in the West End. 
he felt that he should relish his soup the entire morning had been given to winding up the estate of an old friend after filling his mouth with household bread stale he at once began how are you going down to robin hill you going to take irene you had better take her i should think there will be a lot that will want seeing to without looking up soames answered she won't go won't go what's the meaning of that she's going to live in the house isn't she soames made no reply i don't know what's coming to women nowadays mumbled james i never used to have any trouble with them she has had too much liberty she is spoiled soames lifted his eyes i won't have anything said against her he said unexpectedly the silence was only broken now by the souping of james's soup the waiter brought the two glasses of port but soames stopped him that's not the way to serve port he said take them away and bring the bottle rousing himself from his reverie over the soup james took one of his rapid shifting surveys of surrounding facts your mother is in bed he said you can have the carriage to take you down i should think irina would like the drive this young bosney will be there i suppose to show you over soames nodded i should like to go and see for myself what sort of a job he has made finishing off pursued james i will just drive round and pick you both up i am going down by train replied soames if you like to drive round and see irina might go with you i can't tell he signed to the waiter to bring the bill which james paid they parted at st paul's soames branching off to the station james taking his omnibus westwards he had secured the corner seat next to the conductor where his long legs made it difficult for anyone to get in and at all who passed him he looked resentfully as if they had no business to be using up his air he intended to take an opportunity this afternoon of speaking to irene a word in time saved nine and now that she was going to live in the country there was a chance for her to turn over a new leaf he could see that soames would not stand very much more of her goings-on it did not occur to him to define what he meant by her goings-on the expression was wide vague and suited to a foresight and james had more than his common share of courage after lunch on reaching home he ordered out the barouche with special instructions that the groom was to go too he wished to be kind to her and to give her every chance when the door of number sixty two was opened he could distinctly hear her singing and said so at once to prevent any chance of being denied entrance yes mrs soames was in but the maid did not know if she was seeing people james moving with the rapidity that ever astonished the observers of his long figure and absorbed expression went forthwith into the drawing-room without permitting this to be ascertained he found irene seated at the piano with her hands arrested on the keys evidently listening to the voices in the hall she greeted him without smiling your mother-in-law is in bed he began hoping at once to enlist her sympathy i have got the carriage here now be a good girl and put on your hat and come with me for a drive it will do you good irina looked at him as though about to refuse but seeming to change her mind went upstairs and came down again with her hat on where are you going to take me she asked 
"'We will just go down to Robin Hill,' said James, spluttering out his words very quick. "'The horses want exercise, and I should like to see what they have been doing down there.' Irina hung back, but again changed her mind, and went out to the carriage, James brooding over her closely to make quite sure. It was not before he had got her more than halfway that he began. Soames is very fond of you. He won't have anything said against you. Why don't you show him more affection? Irene flushed and said in a low voice, I can't show what I haven't got. James looked at her sharply. He felt that now he had her in his own carriage with his own horses and servants, he was really in command of the situation. She could not put him off, nor would she make a scene in public. I can't think what you are about, he said. He is a very good husband. Irene's answer was so low as to be almost inaudible amongst the sounds of traffic. He caught the words, You are not married to him. What has that got to do with it? He has given you everything you want. He is always ready to take you anywhere, and now he has built you this house in the country. It is not as if you had anything of your own. No. Again James looked at her. He could not make out the expression on her face. She looked almost as if she were going to cry, and yet... I'm sure, he muttered hastily, we have all tried to be kind to you. Irene's lips quivered to his dismay, James saw a tear steal down her cheek. He felt a choke rise in his own throat. We are all fond of you, he said, if you would only. He was going to say behave yourself, but changed it to if you would only be more of a wife to him. Irina did not answer, and James too ceased speaking. There was something in her silence which disconcerted him. It was not the silence of obstinacy, rather that of acquiescence in all that he could find to say. And yet he felt as if he had not had the last word. He couldn't understand this. He was unable, however, to long keep silence. I suppose that young Bosini, he said, will be getting married to June now. Irene's face changed. I don't know, she said. You should ask her. Does she write to you? No. How's that? said James. I thought you and she were such great friends. Irene turned on him. Again, she said, you should ask her. Well, flustered James, frightened by her look, it is very odd that I can't get a plain answer to a plain question, but there it is. He sat ruminating over his rebuff and burst out at last. Well, I have warned you, you won't look ahead. Soames, he doesn't say much, but I can see he won't stand a great deal more of this sort of thing. You will have nobody but yourself to blame, and what is more, you will get no sympathy from anybody. Irina bent her head with a little smiling bow. I'm very much obliged to you. James did not know what on earth to answer. The bright hot morning had changed slowly to a grey oppressive afternoon. A heavy bank of clouds with the yellow tinge of coming thunder had risen in the south and was creeping up. The branches of the trees dropped motionless across the road without the smallest stir of foliage. A faint odour of glue from the heated horses clung in the thick air. The coachman and groom, rigid and unbending, 
exchanged stealthy murmurs on the box without ever turning their heads. To James's great relief, they reached the house at last. The silence and impenetrability of this woman by his side, whom he had always thought so soft and mild, alarmed him. The carriage put them down at the door, and they entered. The hall was cool and so still that it was like passing into a tomb. A shudder ran down James's spine. He quickly lifted the heavy leather curtains between the columns into the inner court. He could not restrain an exclamation of approval. The decoration was really in excellent taste. The dull ruby tiles that extended from the foot of the walls to the verge of a circular clump of tall Irish plants surrounding in turn a sunken basin of white marble filled with water were obviously of the best quality. He admired extremely the purple leather curtains drawn along one entire side framing a huge white tiled stove. The central partitions of the skylight had been slid back, and the warm air from outside penetrated into the very heart of the house. He stood, his hands behind him, his head bent back on his high, narrow shoulders, spying the tracery on the columns and the pattern of the frieze which ran round the ivory-coloured walls under the gallery. Evidently no pains had been spared. It was quite the house of a gentleman. He went up to the curtains, and having discovered how they were worked, drew them asunder and disclosed the picture gallery, ending in a great window taking up the whole end of the room. It had a black oak floor, and its walls again were of ivory white. He went on throwing open doors and peeping in. Everything was in apple pie order, ready for immediate occupation. He turned round at last to speak to Irene, and saw her standing over in the garden entrance with her husband and Bosini. Though not remarkable for sensibility, James felt at once that something was wrong. He went up to them, and vaguely alarmed, ignorant of the nature of the trouble, made an attempt to smooth things over. "'How are you, Mr. Bosini? he said, holding out his hand. "'You have been spending money pretty freely down here, I should say.' Soames turned his back and walked away. James looked from Bosini's frowning face to Irene, and in his agitation spoke his thoughts aloud. Well, I can't tell what's the matter. Nobody tells me anything. And making off after his son, he heard Bosini's short laugh and his, Well, thank God, you look so... Most unfortunately, he lost the rest. What had happened? He glanced back. Irene was very close to the architect, and her face not like the face he knew of her. He hastened up to his son. Soames was pacing the picture gallery. "'What is the matter?' said James. "'What is all this?' Soames looked at him with his supercilious calm unbroken, but James knew well enough that he was violently angry." Our friend, he said, has exceeded his instructions again, that is all. So much the worse for him this time. He turned round and walked back towards the door. James followed hurriedly, edging himself in front. He saw Irene take her finger from before her lips, heard her say something in her ordinary voice, and began to speak before he reached them. There is a storm coming on. We had better get home. We can't take you, I suppose, Mr. Bosini. No, I suppose not. Then good-bye. He held out his hand. 
Bosini did not take it, but turning with a laugh said, Goodbye, Mr. Forsyte, don't get caught in the storm, and walked away. Well, began James, I don't know. But the sight of Irene's face stopped him. Taking hold of his daughter-in-law by the elbow, he escorted her towards the carriage. He felt certain, quite certain, they had been making some appointment or other. Nothing in this world is more sure to upset a foresight than the discovery that something on which he has stipulated to spend a certain sum has cost more. And this is reasonable, for upon the accuracy of his estimates, the whole policy of his life is ordered. If he cannot rely on definite values of property, his compass is amiss. He is adrift upon bitter waters without a helm. After writing to Bosini in the terms that have already been chronicled, Soames had dismissed the cost of the house from his mind. He believed that he had made the matter of the final cost so very plain that the possibility of its being again exceeded had really never entered his head. On hearing from Bosini that his limit of twelve thousand pounds would be exceeded by something like four hundred, he had grown white with anger. His original estimate of the cost of the house completed had been ten thousand pounds, and he had often blamed himself severely for allowing himself to be led into repeated excesses. Over this last expenditure, however, Bosini had put himself completely in the wrong. How on earth a fellow could make such an ass of himself, Soames could not conceive. But he had done so, and all the rancor and hidden jealousy that had been burning against him for so long was now focused in rage at this crowning piece of extravagance. The attitude of the confident and friendly husband was gone. To preserve property, his wife he had assumed it, to preserve property of another kind, he lost it now. Ah, oh, he said to Bosini when he could speak, and I suppose you are perfectly contented with yourself, but I may as well tell you that you have altogether mistaken your man. What he meant by those words he didn't quite know at the time, but after dinner he looked up the correspondence between himself and Bosini to make quite sure. There could be no two opinions about it. The fellow had made himself liable for that extra four hundred, or at all events for three hundred and fifty of it, and he would have to make it good. He was looking at his wife's face when he came to this conclusion. Seated in her usual seat on the sofa, she was altering the lace on a collar. She had not once spoken to him all the evening. He went up to the mantelpiece and, contemplating his face in the mirror, said, Your friend the buccaneer has made a fool of himself. He will have to pay for it. She looked at him scornfully and answered, I don't know what you are talking about. You soon will. A mere trifle, quite beneath your contempt. Four hundred pounds. Do you mean that you are going to make him pay that towards this hateful house? I do. And you know he has got nothing? Yes. Then you are meaner than I thought you. Soames turned from the mirror and, unconsciously taking a china cup from the mantelpiece, clasped his hands around it as though praying. He saw her bosom rise and fall, her eyes darkening with anger, and take no notice of the taunt he asked quietly, Are you carrying on a flirtation with Bosini? No, I am not. Her eyes met his, and he looked away. 
He neither believed nor disbelieved her, but he knew that he had made a mistake in asking. He never had known, never would know, what she was thinking. The sight of her inscrutable face, the thought of all the hundreds of evenings he had seen her sitting there like that, soft and passive, but unreadable, unknown, enraged him beyond measure. I believe you are made of stone, he said, clenching his finger so hard that he broke the fragile cup. The pieces fell into the grate, and Irina smiled. You seem to forget, she said, that cup is not. Soames gripped her arm. A good beating, he said, is the only thing that would bring you to your senses. But turning on his heel, he left the room. End of part two, chapter thirteen, The Perfection of the House, reading by Eva Harnick. Part two, chapter fourteen of The Man of Property. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Harnick. The Foresight Saga, The Man of Property, by John Galsworthy. Part 2, Chapter 14, Soames Sits on the Stairs. Soames went upstairs that night, that he had gone too far. He was prepared to offer excuses for his words. He turned out the gas, still burning in the passage outside their room. Pausing with his hand on the knob of the door, he tried to shape his apology, for he had no intention of letting her see that he was nervous. But the door did not open, nor when he pulled it and turned the handle firmly. She must have locked it for some reason and forgotten. Entering his dressing room where the gas was also light and burning low, he went quickly to the other door. That, too, was locked. Then he noticed that the camp bed which he occasionally used was prepared and his sleeping suit laid out upon it. He put his hand up to his forehead and brought it away wet. It dawned on him that he was barred out. He went back to the door and, rattling the handle stealthily, called. Unlock the door, do you hear? Unlock the door. There was a faint rustling, but no answer. Do you hear? Let me in at once. I insist on being let in. He could catch the sound of her breathing close to the door, like the breathing of a creature threatened by danger. There was something terrifying in this inexorable silence, in the impossibility of getting at her. He went back to the other door and, putting his whole weight against it, tried to burst it open. The door was a new one. He had had them renewed himself, in readiness for their coming in after the honeymoon. In a rage, he lifted his foot to kick in the panel. The thought of the servants restrained him, and he felt suddenly that he was beaten. Flinging himself down in the dressing room, he took up a book. But instead of the print, he seemed to see his wife, with her yellow hair flowing over her bare shoulders and her great dark eyes standing like an animal at bay and the whole meaning of her act of revolt came to him. She meant it to be for good. He could not sit still and went to the door again. He could still hear her, and he called, Irene, Irene. He did not mean to make his voice pathetic. In ominous answer, the faint sound ceased. He stood with clenched hands, thinking. Presently he stole round on tiptoe 
and running suddenly at the other door made a supreme effort to break it open. It creaked but did not yield. He sat down on the stairs and buried his face in his hands. For a long time he sat there in the dark, the moon through the skylight above laying a pale smear which lengthened slowly towards him down the stairway. He tried to be philosophical. Since she had locked her doors, she had no further claim as a wife, and he would console himself with other women. It was but a spectral journey he made among such delights. He had no appetite for these exploits. He had never had much, and he had lost the habit. He felt that he could never recover it. His hunger could only be appeased by his wife, inexorable and frightened behind these shut doors. No other woman could help him. This conviction came to him with terrible force out there in the dark. His philosophy left him and surly anger took its place. Her conduct was immoral, inexcusable, worthy of any punishment within his power. He desired no one but her, and she refused him. She must really hate him then. He had never believed it yet. He did not believe it now. It seemed to him incredible. He felt as though he had lost forever his power of judgment. If she, so soft and yielding, as he had always judged her, could take this decided step, what could not happen? Then he asked himself again if she were carrying on an intrigue with Bosony. He did not believe that she was. He could not afford to believe such a reason for her conduct. The thought was not to be faced. It would be unbearable to contemplate the necessity of making his marital relations public property. Short of the most convincing proofs, he must still refuse to believe, for he did not wish to punish himself. And all the time at heart he did believe. The moonlight cast a greyish tinge over his figure, hunched against the staircase wall. Bosini was in love with her. He hated the fellow and would not spare him now. He could and would refuse to pay a penny piece over twelve thousand and fifty pounds, the extreme limit fixed in the correspondence. Or rather, he would pay, he would pay and sue him for damages. He would go to Jobling and Bolter and put the matter in their hands. He would ruin the impecunious beggar. And suddenly, though, what connection between the thoughts? He reflected that Irene had no money either. They were both beggars. This gave him a strange satisfaction. The silence was broken by a faint creaking through the wall. She was going to bed at last. Ah, oh, joy and pleasant dreams! If she threw the door open wide, he would not go in now. But his lips, that were twisted in a bitter smile, twitched. He covered his eyes with his hands. It was late the following afternoon when Soames stood in the dining-room window gazing gloomily into the square. The sunlight still showered on the plane trees and in the breeze their gay broad leaves shone and swung in rhyme to a barrel organ at the corner. It was playing a waltz, an old waltz that was out of fashion with a fateful rhythm in the notes, and it went on and on, though nothing indeed but leaves danced to the tune. The woman did not look too gay, for she was tired. 
and from the tower houses no one threw her down coppers. She moved the organ on, and three doors off began again. It was the waltz they had played at Rogers when Irene had danced with Bosony, and the perfume of the gardenias she had worn came back to Soames, drifted by the malicious music, as it had been drifted to him then, when she passed, her hair glistening, her eyes so soft, drawing Bosony on and on down an endless ballroom. The organ woman plied her handle slowly. She had been grinding her tune all day, grinding it in Sloane Street, hard by, grinding it perhaps to Bosony himself. Soames turned, took a cigarette from the carven box and walked back to the window. The tune had mesmerized him, and there came into his view Irene, her sunshade furled, hastening homewards down the square in a soft rose-colored blouse with drooping sleeves that he did not know. She stopped before the organ, took out her purse, and gave the woman money. Soames shrank back and stood where he could see into the hall. She came in with her latchkey, put down her sunshade, and stood looking at herself in the glass. Her cheeks were flushed, as if the sun had burned them. Her lips were parted in a smile. She stretched her arms out as though to embrace herself, with a laugh that for all the world was like a sob. Soames stepped forward. Very pretty, he said. But as though shot, she spun round and would have passed him up the stairs. He barred the way. Why such a hurry, he said, and his eyes fastened on a curl of hair fallen loose across her ear. He hardly recognized her. She seemed on fire, so deep and rich the color of her cheeks, her eyes, her lips, and of the unusual blouse she wore. She put up her hand and smoothed back the curl. She was breathing fast and deep, as though she had been running, and with every breath perfume seemed to come from her hair and from her body like perfume from an opening flower. I don't like that blouse, he said slowly. It is a soft, shapeless thing. He lifted his finger towards her breast, but she dashed his hand aside. Don't touch me, she cried. He caught her wrist, she wrenched it away. And where may you have been? he asked. In heaven, out of this house. With those words she fled upstairs. Outside, in thanksgiving, at the very door, the organ grinder was playing the waltz. And Soames stood motionless. What prevented him from following her? Was it that with the eyes of face he saw Bosony looking down from that high window in Sloane Street, straining his eyes for yet another glimpse of Irene's vanished figure, cooling his flushed face, dreaming of the moment when she flung herself on his breast, the scent of her still in the air around, and the sound of her laugh that was like a sob? End of part two, chapter fourteen. Soam sits on the steps. Recording by Eva Harnick. Three, chapter one of The Man of Property. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The Foresight Saga, The Man of Property by John Galsworthy. Part 3, Chapter 1, Mrs. McCander's Evidence. 
Many people, no doubt, including the editor of the ultra-vivisectionist, then in the bloom of its first youth, would say that Soames was less than a man not to have removed the locks from his wife's doors, and after beating her soundly, resumed wedded happiness. Brutality is not so deplorably diluted by humaneness as it used to be, yet a sentimental segment of the population may still be relieved to learn that he did none of these things. For active brutality is not popular with foresights. They are too circumspect, and on the whole too soft-hearted. And in Soames there was some common pride, not sufficient to make him do a really generous action, but enough to prevent his indulging in an extremely mean one, except, perhaps, in very hot blood. Above all this, a true foresight refused to feel himself ridiculous. Short of actually beating his wife, he perceived nothing to be done. He therefore accepted the situation without another word. Throughout the summer and autumn he continued to go to the office to sort his pictures and ask his friends to dinner. He did not leave town. Irene refused to go away. The house at Robin Hill, finished though it was, remained empty and ownerless. Soames had brought a suit against the buccaneer, in which he claimed from him the sum of three hundred and fifty pounds. A firm of solicitors, Messrs. Freak and Abel, had put in a defense on Bassini's behalf. Admitting the facts, they raised a point on the correspondence which, divested of legal phraseology, amounted to this. To speak of a free hand in the terms of this correspondence is an Irish bull. By a chance, fortuitous but not improbable in the close borough of legal circles, a good deal of information came to Soames' ear anent this line of policy, the working partner in his firm, Bastard, happening to sit next at dinner at Walmisley's, the taxing master to young Chankery of the common law bar. The necessity for talking what is known as shop, which comes on all lawyers with the removal of the ladies, caused Chankery, a young and promising advocate, to propound an impersonal conundrum to his neighbor, whose name he did not know, for seated as he permanently was in the background, Bastard had practically no name. He had, said Chankery, a case coming on with a very nice point. He then explained, preserving every professional discretion, the riddle in Soames's case. Everyone, he said, to whom he had spoken, thought it a nice point. The issue was small, unfortunately, though damned serious for his client, he believed, Walmisley's champagne was bad but plentiful. A judge would make short work of it, he was afraid. He intended to make a big effort. The point was a nice one. What did his neighbor say? Bastard, a model of secrecy, said nothing. He related the incident to Soames, however, with some malice, for this quiet man was capable of human feeling, ending with his own opinion that the point was a very nice one. In accordance with his resolve, our foresight had put his interests into the hands of Jobling and Bolter. From the moment of doing so, he regretted that he had not acted for himself. On receiving a copy of Bassini's defense, he went over to their offices. Bolter, who had the matter in hand, Jobling having died some years before, told him that in his opinion it was rather a nice point. He would like counsel's opinion on it. Soames told him to go to a good man, and they went to Waterbuck QC, marking him ten and one, who kept the papers six weeks and then wrote as follows. In my opinion, the true interpretation of this correspondence depends very much on the intention of the parties, and will turn upon the evidence given at the trial. I am of opinion that an attempt should be made to secure from the architect an admission that he understood he was not to spend at the outside more than twelve thousand and fifty pounds. With regard to the expression, a free hand in the terms of this correspondence, to which my attention is directed, the point is a nice one, but I am of opinion that upon the whole the ruling in Boileau v. the Blasted Cement Company Limited will apply. Upon this opinion they acted, administering interrogatories, but to their annoyance Messrs. Freak and Abel answered these in so masterly a fashion that nothing whatever was admitted, and that without prejudice. It was on October 1 that Soames read Waterbuck's opinion in the dining room before dinner. It made him nervous, not so much because of the case of Boileau v. the Blasted Cement Company Limited, as that the point had lately begun to seem to him, too, a nice one. There was about it just that pleasant flavor of subtlety so attractive to the best legal appetites. To have his own impression confirmed by Waterbuck QC would have disturbed any man. 
He sat thinking it over and staring at the empty grate, for though autumn had come, the weather had kept as gloriously fine that jubilee year as if it were still high August. It was not pleasant to be disturbed. He desired too passionately to set his foot on Bassini's neck. Though he had not seen the architect since the last afternoon at Robin Hill, he was never free from the sense of his presence, never free from the memory of his worn face with its high cheekbones and enthusiastic eyes. It would not be too much to say that he had never got rid of the feelings of that night when he heard the peacocks cry at dawn, the feeling that Bassini haunted the house. And every man's shape that he saw in the dark evenings walking past seemed that of him whom George had so appropriately named the buccaneer. Irene still met him, he was certain. Where or how, he neither knew nor asked, deterred by a vague and secret dread of too much knowledge. It all seemed subterranean nowadays. Sometimes when he questioned his wife as to where she had been, which he still made a point of doing, as every foresight should, she looked very strange. Her self-possession was wonderful, but there were moments when, behind the mask of her face, inscrutable as it had always been to him, lurked an expression he had never been used to see there. She had taken to lunching out, too. When he asked Bilson if her mistress had been in to lunch, as often as not she would answer, No, sir. He strongly disapproved of her gadding about by herself and told her so. But she took no notice. There was something that angered, amazed, yet almost amused him about the calm way in which she disregarded his wishes. It was really as if she were hugging to herself the thought of a triumph over him. He rose from the perusal of Waterbuck Q.C.'s opinion, and going upstairs, entered her room, for she did not lock her doors till bedtime. She had the decency, he found, to save the feelings of the servants. She was brushing her hair, and turned to him with strange fierceness. "'What do you want?' she said. "'Please leave my room.' He answered, "'I want to know how long this state of things between us is to last. I have put up with it long enough.' "'Will you please leave my room?' "'Will you treat me as your husband?' "'No.' "'Then I shall take steps to make you.' "'Do.' He stared, amazed at the calmness of her answer. Her lips were compressed in a thin line, her hair lay in fluffy masses on her bare shoulders, in all its strange golden contrast to her dark eyes, those eyes alive with the emotions of fear, hate, contempt, and odd, haunting triumph. "'Now please, will you leave my room?' He turned round and went sulkily out. He knew very well that he had no intention of taking steps, and he saw that she knew, too, knew that he was afraid to. It was a habit with him to tell her the doings of his day, how such and such clients had called, how he had arranged a mortgage for parks, how that long-standing suit of Friar versus Forsyte was getting on, which, arising in the preternaturally careful disposition of his property by his great-uncle Nicholas, who had tied it up so that no one could get at it at all, seemed likely to remain a source of income for several solicitors till the day of judgment. And now he had called in at Jobson's, and seen a boucher sold, which he had just missed buying of Talleyrand and Sons in Pall Mall. He had an admiration for Boucher, Watteau, and all that school. It was a habit with him to tell her all these matters, and he continued to do it even now, talking for long spells at dinner, as though by the volubility of words he could conceal from himself the ache in his heart. Often, if they were alone, he made an attempt to kiss her when she said good night. He may have had some vague notion that some night she would let him, or perhaps only the feeling that a husband ought to kiss his wife. Even if she hated him, he at all events ought not to put himself in the wrong by neglecting this ancient right. And why did she hate him? Even now he could not altogether believe it. It was strange to be hated. The emotion was too extreme. Yet he hated Bassini, that buccaneer, that prowling vagabond, that night-wanderer for in his thoughts Soames always saw him lying in wait, wandering. Ah, but he must be in very low water. Young Burkett, the architect, had seen him coming out of a third-rate restaurant, looking terribly down in the mouth. During all the hours he lay awake, thinking over the situation, which seemed to have no end, unless she should suddenly come to her senses, never once did the thought of separating from his wife seriously enter his head. And the Forsytes, what part did they play in this stage of Soames's subterranean tragedy? Truth to say, little or none, for they were at the sea. From hotels, hydropathics, or lodging houses, they were bathing daily, laying in a stock of ozone to last them through the winter. 
Each section in the vineyard of its own choosing grew and culled and pressed and bottled the grapes of a pet sea air. The end of September began to witness their several returns. In rude health and small omnibuses, with considerable color in their cheeks, they arrived daily from the various termini. The following morning saw them back at their vocations. On the next Sunday, Timothy's was thronged from lunch till dinner. Amongst other gossip, too numerous and interesting to relate, Mrs. Septimus Small mentioned that Soames and Irene had not been away. It remained for a comparative outsider to supply the next evidence of interest. It chanced that one afternoon late in September, Mrs. McCander, Winifred Darty's greatest friend, taking a constitutional with young Augustus Flippard on her bicycle in Richmond Park, passed Irene and Bassini walking from the bracken towards the Sheen Gate. Perhaps the poor little woman was thirsty, for she had ridden long on a hard, dry road, and, as all London knows, to ride a bicycle and talk to young Flippard will try the toughest constitution. Or perhaps the sight of the cool bracken grove whence those two were coming down excited her envy. The cool bracken grove on the top of the hill, with the oak boughs for roof, where the pigeons were raising an endless wedding hymn, and the autumn, humming, whispered to the ears of lovers in the fern, while the deer stole by. The bracken grove of irretrievable delights, of golden minutes in the long marriage of heaven and earth. The bracken grove, sacred to stags, to strange tree-stump fawns leaping around the silver whiteness of a birch tree-nymph at summer dusk. This lady knew all the foresights, and having been at Jones, at home, was not at a loss to see with whom she had to deal. Her own marriage, poor thing, had not been successful, but having had the good sense and ability to force her husband into pronounced error, she herself had passed through the necessary divorce proceedings without incurring censure. She was therefore a judge of all that sort of thing, and lived in one of those large buildings where in small sets of apartments are gathered incredible quantities of foresights, whose chief recreation out of business hours is the discussion of each other's affairs. Poor little woman, perhaps she was thirsty, certainly she was bored, for Flippard was a wit. To see those two in so unlikely a spot was quite a merciful pick-me-up. At the Macander, like all London, time pauses. This small but remarkable woman merits attention. Her all-seeing eye and shrewd tongue were inscrutably the means of furthering the ends of Providence. With an air of being in at the death, she had an almost distressing power of taking care of herself. She had done more, perhaps, in her way than any woman about town to destroy the sense of chivalry which still clogs the wheel of civilization. So smart she was, and spoken of endearingly as the little Macander. Dressing tightly and well, she belonged to a women's club, but was by no means the neurotic and dismal type of member who was always thinking of her rights. She took her rights unconsciously. They came natural to her, and she knew exactly how to make the most of them without exciting anything but admiration amongst that great class to whom she was affiliated, not precisely perhaps by manner, but by birth, breeding, and the true, the secret gauge, a sense of property. The daughter of a Bedfordshire solicitor, by the daughter of a clergyman, she had never, through all the painful experience of being married to a very mild painter with a cranky love of nature, who had deserted her for an actress, lost touch with the requirements, beliefs, and inner feeling of society, and on attaining her liberty she placed herself without effort in the very van of foresightism. Always in good spirits and full of information, she was universally welcomed. She excited neither surprise nor disapprobation when encountered on the Rhine or at Zermatt, either alone or traveling with a lady and two gentlemen. It was felt that she was perfectly capable of taking care of herself, and the hearts of all Forsytes warmed to that wonderful instinct, which enabled her to enjoy everything without giving anything away. It was generally felt that to such women as Mrs. McCander, should we look for the perpetuation and increase of our best type of woman, she had never had any children. If there was one thing more than another that she could not stand, it was one of those soft women with what men called charm about them, and for Mrs. Soames she always had an especial dislike. Obscurely, no doubt, she felt that if charm were once admitted as the criterion, smartness and capability must go to the wall, and she hated, with a hatred the deeper that at times this so-called charm seemed to disturb all calculations, the subtle seductiveness which she could not altogether overlook in Irene. She said, however, that she could see nothing in the woman. There was no go about her. She would never be able to stand up for herself. 
Anyone could take advantage of her, that was plain. She could not see, in fact, what men found to admire. She was not really ill-natured, but, in maintaining her position after the trying circumstances of her married life, she had found it so necessary to be full of information that the idea of holding her tongue about those two in the park never occurred to her. And it so happened that she was dining that very evening at Timothy's, where she went sometimes to cheer the old things up, as she was wont to put it. The same people were always asked to meet her. Winifred Darty and her husband, Francie, because she belonged to the artistic circles, for Mrs. McCander was known to contribute articles on dress to the ladies' kingdom come, and for her to flirt with, provided they could be obtained, two of the Heyman boys, who, though they never said anything, were believed to be fast and thoroughly intimate with all that was latest in smart society. At twenty-five minutes past seven, she turned out the electric light in her little hall, and wrapped in her opera cloak with the chinchilla collar, came out into the corridor, pausing a moment to make sure she had her latch key. These little self-contained flats were convenient, to be sure, she had no light and air, but she could shut it up whenever she liked and go away. There was no bother with servants, and she never felt tied as she was used to when poor dear Fred was always about in his moony way. She retained no rancor against poor dear Fred. He was such a fool. But the thought of that actress drew from her, even now, a little bitter, derisive smile. Firmly snapping the door to, she crossed the corridor, with its gloomy yellow ochre walls, and its infinite vista of brown numbered doors. The lift was going down, and wrapped to the ears in the high cloak, with every one of her auburn hairs in its place, she waited motionless for it to stop at her floor. The iron gates clanked open. She entered. There were already three occupants, a man in a great white waistcoat, with a large, smooth face like a baby's, and two old ladies in black, with mittened hands. Mrs. McCander smiled at them. She knew everybody, and all these three, who had been admirably silent before, began to talk at once. This was Mrs. McCander's successful secret. She provoked conversation. Throughout a descent of five stories, the conversation continued, the lift boy standing with his back turned, his cynical face protruding through the bars. At the bottom they separated, the man in the white waistcoat sentimentally to the billiard room, the old ladies to dine and say to each other, a dear little woman, such a rattle, and Mrs. McCander to her cab. When Mrs. McCander dined at Timothy's, the conversation, although Timothy himself could never be induced to be present, took that wider, man-of-the-world tone current among Forsytes at large, and this, no doubt, was what put her at a premium there. Mrs. Small and Aunt Hester found it an exhilarating change. If only, they said, Timothy would meet her. It was felt that she would do him good. She could tell you, for instance, the latest story of Sir Charles Fiste's son at Monte Carlo, who was the real heroine of Tenmouth Eddy's fashionable novel that everyone was holding up their hands over, and what they were doing in Paris about wearing bloomers. She was so sensible, too, knowing all about that vexed question, whether to send young Nicholas Eldest into the Navy as his mother wished, or make him an accountant as his father thought would be safer. She strongly deprecated the Navy. If you were not exceptionally brilliant, or exceptionally well-connected, they passed you over so disgracefully, and what was it after all to look forward to, even if you became an admiral? A pittance! An accountant had many more chances, but let him be put with a good firm, where there was no risk at starting. Sometimes she would give them a tip on the stock exchange. Not that Mrs. Small or Aunt Hester ever took it. They had indeed no money to invest, but it seemed to bring them into such exciting touch with the realities of life. It was an event. They would ask Timothy, they said. But they never did, knowing in advance that it would upset him. Surreptitiously, however, for weeks after, they would look in that paper, which they took with respect on account of its really fashionable proclivities, to see whether Bright's Rubies or the Woolen Mackintosh Company were up or down. Sometimes they could not find the name of the company at all, and they would wait until James or Roger or even Swithin came in and ask them in voices trembling with curiosity how that Bolivia Lime and Spell trait was doing. They could not find it in the paper. And Roger would answer, what do you want to know for? Some trash. You'll go burning your fingers, investing your money in lime and things you know nothing about. Who told you? And ascertaining what they had been told, he would go away, and making inquiries in the city, would perhaps invest some of his own money in the concern. It was about the middle of dinner, just in fact as a saddle of mutton had been brought in by Smither, that Mrs. McCander, looking airily around, said, 
Oh, and whom do you think I passed today in Richmond Park? You'll never guess. Mrs. Soames and Mr. Bassini. They must have been down to look at the house. Winifred Darty coughed, and no one said a word. It was the piece of evidence they had all unconsciously been waiting for. To do Mrs. McCander justice, she had been to Switzerland and the Italian lakes with a party of three, and had not heard of Soames's rupture with his architect. She could not tell, therefore, the profound impression her words would make. Upright and a little flushed, she moved her small, shrewd eyes from face to face, trying to gauge the effect of her words. On either side of her, a Hayman boy, his lean, taciturn, hungry face turned towards his plate, ate his mutton steadily. These two, Giles and Jessie, were so alike and so inseparable that they were known as the Dromeos. They never talked and seemed always completely occupied in doing nothing. It was popularly supposed that they were cramming for an important examination. They walked without hats for long hours in the gardens attached to their houses, books in their hands, a fox terrier at their heels, never saying a word and smoking all the time. Every morning, about fifty yards apart, they trotted down Campton Hill on two lean hacks, with legs as long as their own, and every morning, about an hour later, still fifty yards apart, they cantered up again. Every evening, wherever they had dined, they might be observed about half-past ten, leaning over the balustrade of the Alhambra promenade. They were never seen otherwise than together, in this way passing their lives apparently perfectly content. Inspired by some dumb stirring within them of the feelings of gentlemen, they turned at this painful moment to Mrs. McCander, and said in precisely the same voice, "'Have you seen the—' Such was her surprise at being thus addressed that she put down her fork, and Smither, who was passing, promptly removed her plate. Mrs. McCander, however, with presence of mind, said instantly, "'I must have a little more of that nice mutton.' But afterwards in the drawing-room she sat down by Mrs. Small, determined to get to the bottom of the matter." and she began. What a charming woman, Mrs. Soames, such a sympathetic temperament. Soames is a really lucky man. Her anxiety for information had not made sufficient allowance for that inner foresight skin which refuses to share its troubles with outsiders. Mrs. Septimus Small, drawing herself up with a creak and rustle of her whole person, said shivering in her dignity, My dear, it is a subject we do not talk about. End of Part 3, Chapter 1 Recording by Leanne Howlett Part 3, Chapter 2 of The Man of Property This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter The Foresight Saga The Man of Property By John Galsworthy Part 3, Chapter 2, Night in the Park Although, with her infallible instinct, Mrs. Small had said the very thing to make her guest more intrigué than ever, it is difficult to see how else she could truthfully have spoken. It was not a subject which the Forsytes could talk about even among themselves. To use the word Soames had invented to characterise to himself the situation, it was subterranean. Yet within a week of Mrs. McCander's encounter in Richmond Park, to all of them, save Timothy, from whom it was carefully kept, to James on his domestic beat from the poultry to Park Lane, to George, the wild one, on his daily adventure from the bow-window at the Haversnake to the billiard-room at the Red Pottle, was it known that those two had gone to extremes. George, it was he who invented many of those striking expressions, still current in fashionable circles, voiced the sentiment more accurately than any one, when he said to his brother Eustace that the buccaneer was going it, he expected Soames, was about fed up. It was felt that he must be, and yet what could be done? He ought perhaps to take steps, but to take steps would be deplorable. Without an open scandal, which they could not see their way to recommending, it was difficult to see what steps could be taken. In this impasse, the only thing was to say nothing to Soames, and nothing to each other, in fact to pass it over. 
by displaying towards Irene a dignified coldness, some impression might be made upon her, but she was seldom now to be seen, and there seemed a slight difficulty in seeking her out on purpose to show her coldness. Sometimes, in the privacy of his bedroom, James would reveal to Emily the real suffering that his son's misfortune caused him. "'I can't tell,' he would say. "'It worries me out of my life. There'll be a scandal, and that'll do him no good. I shan't say anything to him. There might be nothing in it. What do you think? She's very artistic, they tell me.' "'What? Oh, you're a regular Julie. Well, I don't know. I expect the worst. This is what comes of having no children. I knew it would be from the first. They never told me they didn't mean to have any children. Nobody tells me anything.' On his knees by the side of the bed, his eyes open and fixed with worry, he would breathe into the counterpane. Clad in his nightshirt, his neck poked forward, his back rounded, he resembled some long white bird. "'Our father,' he repeated, turning over and over again the thought of this possible scandal. Like old Jolyon, he too, at the bottom of his heart, set the blame of the tragedy down to family interference. What business had that lot? He began to think of the Stanhope Gate branch, including young Jolyon and his daughter, as that lot, to introduce a person like this Bassini into the family. He had heard George's soubriquet, the buccaneer, but he could make nothing of that. The young man was an architect. He began to feel that his brother Jolyon, to whom he had always looked up, and on whose opinion he had relied, was not quite what he had expected. Not having his eldest brother's force of character, he was more sad than angry. His great comfort was to go to Winifred's, and take the little darties in his carriage over to Kensington Gardens, and there, by the round pond, he could be often seen walking, with his eyes fixed anxiously on little Publius Darty's sailing-boat, which he himself had freighted with a penny, as though convinced that it would never again come to shore, while little Publius, who, James delighted to say, was not a bit like his father, skipping along under his lee, would try to get him to bet another that it never would having found that it always did. And James would make the bet. He always paid, sometimes as many as three or four pennies in an afternoon, for the game seemed never to pall on little Publius. And always in paying, he said, "'Now that's for your money-box. Why, you're getting quite a rich man!' The thought of his little grandson's growing wealth was a real pleasure to him. But little Publius knew a sweet shop, and a trick worth two of that." and they would walk home across the park. James's figure, with high shoulders and absorbed and worried face, exercising its tall, lean protectorship, pathetically unregarded, over the robust child figures of Imogen and little Publius. But those gardens and that park were not sacred to James. Foresights and tramps, children and lovers, rested and wandered, day after day, night after night, seeking one and all some freedom from labour, from the reek and turmoil of the streets. The leaves browned slowly, lingering with the sun and summer-like warmth of the nights. On Saturday, October the 5th, the sky, that had been blue all day, deepened after sunset to the bloom of purple grapes. There was no moon, and a clear dark, like some velvety garment, was wrapped around the trees, whose thin branches, resembling plumes, stirred not in the still, warm air. All London had poured into the park, draining the cup of summer to its dregs. Couple after couple, from every gate, they streamed along the paths and over the burnt grass, and one after another, silently, out of the lighted spaces, stole into the shelter of the feathery trees, where, blotted against some trunk or under the shadow of shrubs, they were lost to all but themselves, in the heart of the soft darkness. To fresh-comers along the paths, these forerunners formed but part of that passion at dusk, whence only a strange murmur, like the confused beating of hearts, came forth. But when that murmur reached each couple in the lamplight, their voices wavered and ceased, their arms enlaced, their eyes began seeking, searching, 
probing the blackness. Suddenly, as though drawn by invisible hands, they too stepped over the railing, and silent as shadows were gone from the light. The stillness, enclosed in the far inexorable roar of the town, was alive with the myriad passions, hopes, and loves of multitudes of struggling human atoms. For in spite of the disapproval of that great body of Forsytes, the Municipal Council, to whom love had long been considered, next to the sewage question, the gravest danger to the community, a process was going on that night in the park, and in a hundred other parks, without which the thousand factories, churches, shops, taxes, and drains, of which they were the custodians, were as arteries without blood, a man without a heart. The instincts of self-forgetfulness, of passion and of love hiding under the trees, away from the trustees of their remorseless enemy, the sense of property, were holding a stealthy revel, and Soames, returning from Bayswater, for he had been alone to dine at Timothy's, walking home along the water, with his mind upon that coming lawsuit, had the blood driven from his heart by a low laugh and the sound of kisses. He thought of writing to the Times the next morning, to draw the attention of the editor to the condition of our parks. He did not, however, for he had a horror of seeing his name in print. But, starved as he was, the whispered sounds in the stillness, the half-seen forms in the dark, acted on him like some morbid stimulant. He left the path along the water, and stole under the trees, along the deep shadow of little plantations, where the boughs of chestnut-trees hung their great leaves low, and there was a blacker refuge, shaping his course in circles, which had for their object a stealthy inspection of chairs side by side against tree-trunks, of enlaced lovers who stirred at his approach. Now he stood still on the rise overlooking the serpentine, where, in full lamplight, black against the silver water, sat a couple who never moved, the woman's face buried on the man's neck, a single form, like a carved emblem of passion, silent and unashamed. And, stung by the sight, Soames hurried on, deeper into the shadow of the trees. In this search who knows what he thought and what he sought? Bread for hunger, light in darkness— who knows what he expected to find? Impersonal knowledge of the human heart? The end of his private subterranean tragedy? For again, who knew but that each dark couple, unnamed, unnameable, might not be he and she? But it could not be such knowledge as this that he was seeking. The wife of Soames Forsyte, sitting in the park like a common wench? Such thoughts were inconceivable and from tree to tree, with his noiseless step, he passed. Once he was sworn at. Once the whisper, "'If only it could always be like this,' sent the blood flying again from his heart, and he waited there, patient and dogged, for the two to move. But it was only a poor, thin slip of a shop-girl in her draggled blouse, who passed him, clinging to her lover's arm." A hundred other lovers, too, whispered that hope in the stillness of the trees. A hundred other lovers clung to each other. But, shaking himself with sudden disgust, Soames returned to the path, and left that seeking for what he knew not what. End of Part 3 Chapter 2